everyone. Welcome to Clock Crime and Keto and Crime. Today I've got uh, an episode that's not quite a crime, but it is a very interesting study, I think. Um, we've been doing a lot of delving into cults and religions lately, and you all seem to be enjoying that, so I thought I'd keep that trend going. Uh, today we're going to look at Christian missionary John Allen Chow. I'll drop a picture here. He, um, if you remember, November 2018, he was killed by a remote tribe known as the Sintelese who uh, occupy the Adamant Islands just off the coast of India. He was not supposed to be there. In fact, the Indian government has banned travel around the island based on a couple of uh, incidents even before Mr. Chow that really shows how dangerous this tribe can be, as well as they just don't want any outside visitors. They've lived there for centuries and they just don't want anybody around them. So we're going to delve into why he went there, what may have motivated him, and kind of the aftermath of, of that. So I think it's going to be a really interesting study and I hope you'll stick around and watch it. Um, before we dive into it, a quick shout out to my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much. And a few more of you come on board and I really appreciate it. I uh, couldn't do this without you. Uh, also, to anyone that watches, shares, likes my videos, thank you so much. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and if I haven't earned your subscription, I uh, hope today's the day I do it. Please hit that below. Also, smash the like button, comment, even an emoji helps get the channel into the YouTube algorithm. And with that being said, oh yes, I'm still in Chattanooga. This is the reason for the, the different scenery behind me. Um, our dogs have been sleeping here, so... If you see them come in and join me, that's why I'm sitting in front of the, the bed they're using for the interim. We'll be here for another week, uh, and then uh, we'll be back home again. But the uh, show went well. I hope to have some video of that up real soon. And uh, without further ado, let's dive into John Allen Chow. understand the mind of John Allen Chow, I think it's um, relevant that we dive into the tribe that uh, killed him and uh, learn a little bit about them and understand why there has been a travel ban around their island for many years now. But let's dive in and talk about them. The Centelese, which I'll drop some pictures here. are estimated to number about a hundred. So th this is not a hugely populated area. They are the most isolated of the four tribes that are native to the Adamant Islands, which are off the coast of India. I'll drop a map here. Not a whole lot is known about the Centelese. International organizations that do study them, study them from afar. And based on um, tales of survivors that have seen them up close, um, but it is believed that they live in three distinct bands, um, hunters, gatherers, farmers, and then those that may or may not protect the beach. It seems that that's kind of how it, it delves out. But there are two types of living situations that we can tell. There's large communal huts that uh, house several different families, and then there's more temporary shelters, uh, which are just thatch roofs that are sometimes seen on the beach and only house one family. So it appears there's a very different, you know, totem, if you will, for how these people live. It is also believed that the elderly are kind of separated from the main band. Uh, this was relevant in Chow's diary of his encounter, that there were a lot of elderly people and small children on the beach. So it seems that maybe the elderly and the children are separated from the main tribe for a time. Um, the women do the majority of the gathering and the work. They gather, they, they cook and clean what the men hunt. Um, they are normally seen wearing ceremonial necklaces and headpieces, um, bands, not really like huge headdresses, but bands that appear to house flowers and stones from the island. 
And uh, they also wear a thicker waist belt than, than the men. The men wear waist belts, bands, and often carry spears, bows, and arrows made out of stone and wood found on the island. Their way of life has been described as Stone Age, although I, most experts agree that's not necessarily the truth. They are not as modern as modern people, but they are certainly not in the Stone Age. They have advanced far beyond that from what we can view from a safe distance. Um, they're also remarkably healthy. There has not been evidence that they have succumbed to any illnesses, including the current pandemic, um, because of their isolation from modern man. So we truly believe they have a better, a better resistance, a better immune system than a lot of the tribes in the island, or just that they have been lucky enough not to be exposed to our modern diseases and have lived out their life in relative obscurity. Uh, Western civilization has had very little contact with the Sensibles. In the 1800s, a British officer by the name of M.V. Portman, who was the naval officer in charge of basically colonizing, colonizing the Adaman Islands during the uh, when the British took over India, uh, encountered them um, briefly. Uh, he said that it was mainly a deserted village that he found, and he also were able to find a elderly couple and some children who he took aboard his ship and took to nearby Port Blair, the island's capital, but they were, uh, the elderly caught a western illness and died, and the children were taken back, were taken back to the island with some gifts. Now, it is believed that the Sensalese believed this was a kidnapping, so they weren't too happy with the uh, the visitors, and that set off um, a lot of hostility between the Sentinelese and anyone that would dare to visit their island. Also, he discovered that they were using some iron. Uh, he found spears that were actually not stone, but iron, which leads them to believe that they had um, taken, you know, metal that had washed ashore from uh, British ships and had used that to their advantage. So these are very smart people. Believe it or not, that was the last encounter with uh, the Western world the Sentinels had in the 19th century that we're aware of, and a lot of the 20th century. In fact, um, there was an incident in 1967 where some British anthropologists, British and Indian anthropologists, attempted to make contact with the tribe. It did not go so well. They were seemingly told, no thanks, not today. And so... Uh, that was pretty much it for the, for the uh, remainder of the 20th century. In the 21st century, uh, there was a couple of incidents where the tribe came into contact with the Western world, and that was uh, after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. Some helicopters from uh, actually groups that are in favor of them being allowed to live isolation did fly over to make sure that they, they had survived the storm. And... Uh, they were greeted with arrows and spears being taught, hurled at the helicopters. So evidently they did survive, and they didn't want anybody around them. So, And then we fast forward to 2006, where two Indian fishermen who were poaching uh, in the uh, nearby waters uh, evidently fell asleep in their fishing boats, the small dinghies, and kind of drifted toward the island, and uh, they were killed. They were found dead in their boats, most likely from Sentinelese arrows. So, yeah, they do not want to be infiltrated. They do not want to be colonized. They do not want to be missionary to. They just want to be left alone. And then that brings us up to Mr. John Allen Chow. Chow was born December 18th, 1991 in Alabama. Uh, he was the third and youngest child of Linda Adams Chow, who is an American-born lawyer and an organizer for Chai Alpha, a uh, international honor society, and Patrick Chow, who was a Chinese-born medical doctor, a actual psychiatrist, um, and he actually had um, some early brushes with. Uh, danger himself. His, his father actually escaped both he 
and himself, both he and himself, from the Mao government early on in the uh, Cultural Revolution in China, and the two were able to escape to the United States, where Patrick Chow was raised. Um, that he met Linda Adams at Oral Roberts University when he was a medical student and she was a professor. And the two married and eventually had three children, including John. Now, <clears throat> I was kind of interested in the fact that they mentioned Oral Roberts University, which, uh, if you know anything about televangelists, you know that Oral Roberts was quite a controversial one. This was his school that he started. He was the one that basically said um, that if he didn't uh, receive so much money in grants for a huge uh, project he was planning in the Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Oklahoma area, that God would call him home, if you recall that, in the 70s and 80s. Well, this is his school. And... Uh, it really uh, interested me the fact that they said they had an actual medical school. So I did some research, and it, evidently at one time they did have a school of medicine. Uh, it's basically, it was tied to Oral Roberts' famous, if, you, if I don't raise enough money, I'm going to die, because the City of Faith Medical and Research Center Hospital was opened in 1981. That's what he needed the money to build. But just three years prior to that, uh, he did start the Oral Roberts University School of Medicine in 1978, which for a televangelist that pushed the whole doctrine of the prosperity gospel and faith healing, it's kind of interesting to me that uh, they had a medical school. I mean, if your whole ministry is based on faith healing, why do you need a medical school? Some of those things just don't make, make sense to me. But both of these schools did close the, both the hospital, which is now like a, a corporate office building, and the School of Medicine closed in 1989. And Patrick Chow, who studied chemical engineering at USC, was one of the few medical graduates of the Oral Roberts University Medical School. And he did meet, meet Linda Adams there. She was a professor. He was a medical student. And evidently, they had no rules about fraternization. And uh, they became a couple and eventually married, leading to the birth of John. Now, John was always uh, into reading and especially into the outdoors. He's commented as saying one of his favorite books as a child was Robinson Crusoe, which I remember reading that as a kid. Um, very interesting story about a, a British man that is uh, shipwrecked on an island. He finds a, a native man by the name of uh, Friday, and they actually build a nice little civilization for themselves on an abandoned island until the British find them again. So um, he became quite a fan of that. He also started reading things like Sign of the Beaver and My Side of the Mountain, My Side of the Mountain, about a boy that uh, runs away to the Adirondack Mountains in New York and kind of lives off the land. Uh, one of my favorites as a kid also made a very good movie about that. So um, those are some very good books. And he said because of those stories, he really felt a kinship with the outdoors and spent as much time as he could outdoors. He loved to camp. He loved to fish. He loved to explore. And he knew that he, on his, he was, he knew from an early age that there was a calling on his life to do something more. And he kind of took that love of the outdoors and also his love of being a Christian missionary because they were raised about evangelical Christians, uh, probably of the Pentecostal type because of the Oral Roberts connection. Even though and now in interviews, Patrick Chow claims to be an atheist, that he believes that what happened to his son was because of radicalization and um, being fed a lot of BS, that he, he's more of a, he was more of a Confucius you know, believer than actual Christian, but that his son was fed a line of bull is basically what he said, and he felt that has contributed and led to his death. But it was a love of wanting to spread, you know, the Great Commission spread the word of Jesus Christ, along with the love of the outdoors that led him to read stories of former Christian missionaries and set him on a path that would sadly lead to his death. He had, he really admired three former missionaries. David Livingstone, which uh, he was a Scottish missionary. He was also a physician that 
basically journeyed into the deepest, darkest parts of unknown Africa during that time to basically become a Protestant missionary. He's a working class rags to riches story, which of course John Allen Chow being the son of an attorney and a medical doctor probably didn't suffer that same fate, but Mr. Livingston was a rags to riches story. He worked his way through medical school, became a international missionary and explorer. He's more known for being an explorer than anything else. If you recall movies like in the 80s cartoons, uh, they would often, if they were, if it was a movie about an explorer, it would, they would often say, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Remember that? Well, this is who they're referring to because he did explore so much of darkest Africa, but he's, as I said, more known for being an explorer than a missionary. He was a huge anti-slave slave crusader. He did try to interfere and stop the uh, slave trade that was pretty prevalent in the 1800s, uh, but he was also an advocate of a British colonial expansion, which it seems that those would be kind of contra you know, contradictory against the slave trade, but you're for colonization. So he was more about the British simply taking over and bringing the, you know, the natives into their way of thinking and living and taking them as slaves. Um, but you have to remember he was a man of his time. We have to explore these things and the relevance of their time. And he lived from 1813 to 1873. So probably not that unusual thinking for that time, but that's one that he studied. Another was Bruce Olson, who was a um, Scandinavian American Christian miss missionary. Um, he missioned to the Molanto Indians of Colombia and Venezuela. He wrote a couple of books about his journey. Uh, in 1973, his book Broco had sold more than 300,000 copies, and he basically spent his entire life in South America um, helping the the uh, Aboriginal tribes of that area convert to Christianity. Uh, he was granted Colombian citizenship in 1988 and is still lived in South American native villages up until his death. Um, he came under some scrutiny because uh, he was accused by Swedish anthropologists of destroying several tribes by, you know, causing them to lose their culture as well as exposure to disease. But he is still a person that John Allen Chow read about. And the third missionary that he really admired was Jim Elliott, an American-born Christian missionary that um, basically dedicated his life to the Indians of Ecuador. Um, Sadly, he was killed by the very uh, tribe in Ecuador, a very, at that time, very isolated tribe known as the Horoni. And unfortunately, his life was cut short when trying to make contact with the tribe. He and four other missionaries were killed by the very people they were trying to mission to. And it, ironically, his wife, who he married just before his death, Clara would return and mission to those very same natives several years later. So I think you can see that a lot of these missionary stories are sort of self-destructive in a way, and these are the kinds of stories and things that John Allen Cho started to look up to. When Chow was very young, they were relocated from the south to the Pacific Northwest to Vancouver, Washington. This is where his father still practices psychiatry today at the age of 68, and his uh, mother still practices law, so they are still there. Um, do not send any sort of thing out to them. I mean, you can Google them and find them, but I, they're not, shouldn't be held, you know, they shouldn't be disturbed. They've already lost enough with the death of their son, but I am telling you, they still are in Vancouver. Um, he often, uh, the family would go camping, hunting, and John Allen Cho's earliest diary entries, you know, talked about how he would learn what berries could be eaten, what plants could be eaten, and how he really, um, delved into that part of the outdoors, and how his love of the missionary stories we've talked about led him to believe that it was his life's calling to spread the word of God all around the world. Um, there's some early film of him, which you can find just by Googling it, where he 
is at a um, a mission an early mission trip as a high schooler in Mexico where he's talking about how it's their it's his responsibility their responsibility as Christians to bring the word of God to the masses and he really started he started reading about the Sinhalese people early on because there's been several missionary organizations that have labeled these islands as the last Satan's last stronghold of people that have not heard the gospel. And if you know anything about the Christian Commission, you know that before Christ's second coming, they must tell everyone about the good news. And so that is their goal. There, no part of the world will be untouched by the gospel. And this is one of the few that's kind of, you know, holding them back from that goal, so to speak. So it's high up on a lot of Christian missionaries' list to get this place missionary to. And unfortunately, because the Indian government have made it illegal to approach the island, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble. I don't, any missionary work that goes on there is probably in secret. He was a, John Allen Chow was a member of the Royal Rangers, which is a Pentecostal scouting organization. I don't understand why the normal Boy Scouts aren't good enough for them, but okay. Um, a lot of the medals in this organization revolve around knowledge of the Bible. So you get, um, whereas Boy Scouts are a more secular organization, this you know kind of revolves around ability to you know read the Bible, memorize the Bible. That's how you get your medals and your badges. Um, again, he went on a couple of mission trips to Mexico and started reading posts by the Joshua Project. That's one of those uh, organizations that have the Sentinelese Island high up on their list of things that, that the places they have to get the gospel into. And he would tell people on his mission trips, he would show them a map of the Sentinelese Islands and say, hey, I'm going there. I'm going to crack through that wall. Kind of thing. He didn't say crack through that wall, but he did say he was going there. And this was all before the age of 18 that he started having this life's goal. He, just like his parents, attended Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma, which I'm sure didn't, didn't help to sway him from this, this uh, decision. And uh, as soon as he, during his uh, tenure there as well as just after graduation, he would spend his summers uh going on different mission trips to Mexico. He also went into South Africa where he taught a lot of uh, soccer camps. And he also went to India where he taught soccer camps, set up soccer camps for Syrian refugees, as well as caught his first glimpse of the Sentinelese Islands. And this gave him more, even more motivation to one day bridge that gap, get in there and mission to these people. Chow met a, another fellow missionary, John Middleton Ramsey, in Israel in 2014, where he was there setting up soccer camps. And he commented that he was an easy guy to talk to. He was very much into what he was doing. He was uh, not, didn't seem to be interested in girls, even though he got a lot of female attention because he was a very good looking young man. But he believed that any romantic entanglement would set him back on his life's goal of reaching the Sentinelese people. Uh, just after uh, he returned from Israel, he underwent a intensive uh, wilderness EMT course in, uh, in Kansas and actually received his wilderness EMT because he felt that he would also need to provide medical care for any people that he came upon. So he did become a certified wilderness EMT. I will drop a picture of his certificate right here. And he was true to his word. After receiving that wilderness EMT, he spent three summers working at Whiskey Town National Recreation Area in California, where he worked as a ranger and emergency nurse. He lived alone in a small cabin, again, reading the Bible, reading these missionary stories, and spending his days hiking, swimming, fishing, hunting, and taking a lot of pictures. If you go to John Allen Chow's Instagram, which is still up today, you will see pictures of everything he has done. He was very much into capturing 
the memories, so to speak. He was very much into documenting what he was doing. He almost appeared to me, now this may, it's just my opinion, that he was more of a wilderness adventurer with some missionary tendencies than an actual missionary. To me, he was much more braggiose than just a, a normal missionary would be. I think he was more into the adventure side of it and documenting his, you know, to me it was like a travel blog. He, he was a travel lifestyle blogger that had a lot of followers and used the missionary thing as kind of a tip-off. Now, you may call me cruel for saying that, but that's the impression that I got from looking at his Instagram. He was more about documenting the experience than actually doing anything. And again, I could be wrong, but that's just the... In fact, he was so popular on his blog that he actually was do, had an endorsement from a beef jerky company where he was just like any influencer you may see today, he had endorsements. So I'll leave, I'll let you go to his Instagram, check it out, and leave that to your own opinions. Um, he did get lost <laughs> and bitten by a rattlesnake during his excursions in California. Um, he and two friends were lost for 14 days. They didn't manage to find their way out. He almost died from a rattlesnake bite. But he was miraculously gotten to uh, medical care and survived it. Um, then in 2015, 2016, he was, uh, he did his first couple of trips to the Adamant Islands where he made contact with Christian missionaries that were already on the island that were already speaking to the other four tribes that are on the island. And so he got his appetite even more wet. And then in 2017, he was accepted into the All Nations Boot Camp, which is a Kansas City, Missouri organization that works to see Jesus worshipped in every tongue, tribe, and nation. And it includes a promise that the Christians that go through their program will basically have a wartime mentality and make the uh, strategic decision that they're battling a real enemy and that getting to the most unknown tribes it should be their life's work. And so he went through their boot camp of dealing with uh, hostile tribes. He did pass. He was basically put blindfolded in the backwoods of Missouri and Kansas and told to walk this trail. And he was met with people pretending to be tribesmen that were hostile. He did pass it, but unfortunately this wasn't real preparation for what was to come. Um, All Nations leader Mary Ho once said that Chow was one of the best trainees the program ever had. Way to jump on and get on that notoriety train there, Mary. Anyway, um, he also attended uh, Canadian Institute of Linguistics where he studied unknown languages. Um, that seems to be an oxymoron, but okay. But he learned to you know put together dialects to hopefully speak to these people. He did basically excel at those studies as he did with uh, everything. And he was literally preparing for his life's work of going into making contact with the North Sentinelese people. And he finally got his chance in 2018. In October of 2018, he touched down in Port Blair, which was the capital of the Adamant Islands. Uh, he took up residence in a Christian safe house. He spent the weeks before attempting to make contact with the North Sentinelese uh, basically barricading himself into his room with no direct contact with sunlight because it was believed that if you could limit your connection with sunlight that you could kill the bacteria on your skin and not be as big of a disease risk to these people that have never been exposed to Western culture that could be very susceptible to um, Western diseases. So he believed that this was a way for him to avoid giving them anything. I think it's funny that he cared about their soul, but not about their physical well-being. But anyway, he basically barricaded himself in out of sunlight. Uh, he spent his time reading the Bible. He read the story of the Judson sisters, again, another missionary story. He also assembled uh, his contact response kit, which was picture cards for communication, bandages, dental forceps for removing arrows, gifts for the sensories, including tweezers, scissors, cords, safety pins, and fish hooks. It was his intent to give them gifts in hopes that they would allow him to approach safely. 
He also documented uh, his entire trip and his handwritten diary. Pieces of it are available online. All you have to do is search. Uh, very difficult to read. Uh, he's like myself. He didn't have the best handwriting. But I just found that it was uh, very interesting what he did for those two weeks before he went in and attempted to make contact. He very much did isolate himself. He prayed. He read missionary stories for uh, inspiration. And he added to his contact kit. But you're like, Tracy, it's illegal to approach these people. The Indian government says no. How was he going to make contact? Well, that was through illegal practices with the help of a certain... Uh, Evangelical organizations like the Joshua Project, they paid uh, two fishermen, you know, fishermen still poach in these waters, so that two fishermen were paid the equivalent of $25,000 in Indian money to take him close to the islands. And they attempted it twice. On November 14th, um, he, the fishermen, and a couple other Christian missionaries who had volunteered to help set out early morning in the darkness to go make contact with the Sentinelese. He actually caught a couple of fish, some large tuna, and uh, was going to, to attempt to approach them on the morning of the 15th. He did just that. He got into a boat with the two fish that he had caught, very large tuna, and paddled his kayak as close to the island as he could get, trying to stay out of range of their arrows, and began yelling at the Sentinelese, I am John, I love you, Jesus loves you, please accept these fish. Well, of course, um, Sentinelese weren't having it, and they did start firing at him. Uh, basically, uh, arrows swarming all around him. He hurled the fish out of the boat towards the Sentinelese, and he dived into the water and swam back to the boat because he was afraid of keeping himself above the boat because he might get shot. So he swam back to the boat. And yes, they did shoot at him to kill. His actual waterproof Bible was struck by an arrow, and a lot of people would say it was a miracle. The Bible protected him. I see it in a different way. But he did manage to make it back to the boat. But they did not dissuade him. Upon abandoning his boat, he did in fact abandon some important documents like his passport. So he was essentially trapped. Uh, he wrote in his diary after that attempt on the 15th, if you want me to, actually, he's praying to God here, if you want me to actually get shot or even killed with an arrow, then so be it. I think it would, I would be more useful alive, though. I don't want to die. Would it be wiser to leave and let someone else continue? No, I don't think so. I could still make it back to the U.S. somehow. It almost seems like certain death to stay here. Prophetic words. On the 16th, when he was preparing to make another approach, he wrote a diary entry basically to his parents where he said, you guys might think I'm crazy and all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people, he said. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to do. I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. This is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of worshiping God in their own language. As Revelation 7, 9 through 10 states, he signed off, all glory to God. November 16th, the fishermen once again made an approach. They put him into a kayak. He told them to leave for the day and to come back for him at night, and he was going to make contact with these people and hopefully bring them Bring them the, the word of Jesus. So he got into a boat. He paddled toward the island. The boat did leave him. And unfortunately, when they returned, they saw members of the tribe running up and down the beach, dragging the lifeless body of John Allen Cho behind them. And that's where his body still remains today because it's far too dangerous to go in and try to retrieve it. And this is where a hailstorm of criticism comes in from all different types of organizations about how he broke the law, how he possibly exposed a tribe to pathogens that they would not have otherwise been exposed to, and how it was quite reckless of him to do what he did. You also have missionary organizations praising him. So there was quite a lot of going back and forth. Uh, the Indian government has only tightened on their hold on the Adamant Islands to keep people away. 
The fishermen that were a part and the missionaries that were a part of this were prosecuted in the Indian legal system. And they believe it's this proves that there is no reason to go to these islands and try to speak to these tribes. The tribes want to be left alone, so please leave them alone. That's kind of the Indian government's take on it. But uh, Patrick Chow, John Chow's uh, father, spoke on it, saying that he sees no good in religion, that his son was radicalized by a group of people that his Confucianism could not could not dwarf their influence in his son's life, and he doesn't want to speak of it anymore. So it's kind of a sad end. Um, so what's your opinion? Do you think that he was a dedicated missionary that was really trying to do good, or was he, like I said, more of a adventure blogger that just wanted to take his adventures to the max? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I do know that it's a sad loss to a young life that could have been so much more, but... Anyway, whatever you believe, let me know down below, and I'll be back real soon with another video. Until next time, keto a crime.